Well, I think it's not just real estate investing. I think it's any business that you're going to start mm -hmm. is, is really knowing your why. Your why is what's going to push you through those tough days. Your why is what's going to make you celebrate the wins and they're going to taste sweeter. Your why is what's going to say like, man, I'm, I'm going to persist no matter what. And I don't think enough business owners start a business without core values yeah. or knowing their why. Welcome to the Threefold Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is the podcast where you'll not only learn how you can achieve massive success in multifamily real estate investing, but also how you can simultaneously pursue great relationships with your family and a better walk with God. You can achieve financial freedom through real estate investing without sacrificing the relationships that mean the most to you. Now, here's your host, Lee Yoder. Welcome back, Threefold listeners. Hope you're having a great week. We've got another great guest today. Steve Libman is joining us from South Carolina today. A little bit about Steve and then we'll bring him in. He's one of the managing partners of Integrity Holdings Group. Prior to Integrity, Steve began as a realtor and then flipped almost a thousand properties in the residential real estate space after getting burnt out in a very transactional, highly taxed business model. Uh, Integrity Holdings Group moved into the multifamily and self-storage space to create passive tax advantage income for themselves and their investors. Wow. Can't wait to dig into that story. Steve, uh, th thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you. Yeah, Lee, thanks for having me, man. Always excited to talk to, uh, to folks about the intersection of business and faith and family. And I love what you're, what you're putting on here and can't wait to dive Yeah. In. Let's go ahead and jump back all the way back to you getting started in real estate, Steve. So I, I actually started as a real estate, as a realtor. Yeah. Uh, my sister-in-law at the time, started a real estate brokerage, seven, eight, 2007, eight. Okay. And she was part of a national group that was selling uh, foreclosures. So during the big foreclosure boom, we got yep. in and we were, we were the listing agent for banks. Well, she was. Okay. And I was working in her office, finding these types of distressed deals for investors. So okay. I, uh, I never really focused on the residential retail side of it. It was residential, but it was mostly for flips. So we were sourcing off market or on market deals for these um, this book of buyers that I had, and it was a good business. It learned, it taught me a lot about how to uh, analyze a deal and see what kind of uh, construction costs it would be, and figure out how to do that. Um, and one day, I, so I was a realtor first. After three years of doing that, I was a broker uh, okay. of the office for. Um, couple more years. Was this coming right out of college, Stephen? No, I bounced around in Manhattan doing some sales jobs first. Okay. Um, but yeah. I mean, I was, you're still pretty young at this point. Yeah, I'm 25, okay. yeah. 26 at this point. Yep. Um, turning 40 this week. So that's how long the, the journey has been. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it was a broker, was still sourcing those deals, was working with, with um, investor clients. And one day, one of the clients that I bought like five or six houses for that year that he made some significant profits on. We're sitting at the closing table and he said, Hey, I went by the house before closing and th th there's a pool ladder that's missing. And I said, okay, so it's like 400 bucks or 250 bucks, whatever. Yeah. Um, and they just get into this argument, right? We can't figure out. And he turns to me and says, well, you take it out of your commission. I'm not paying for it. And I was his realtor. Right. And I was like, well, that's, so I just went outside with the other realtor and I said, let's just split the cost of this thing, move on, right? And we did. And I came home that day and I said, you know, I don't really like working for anybody else. I think, <laughs> I think now's the time, right? Now that I know how to source off market deal flow and I understand the business a little bit, I said, I think now's the time to take the leap and, uh, and go out on my own. And, and I did. And uh, ironically enough, I reached out to this guy, um, just about two years ago, I still had his phone number and I thanked him because I don't think I ever told him that he was the one that gave me that push to go out on my own. And he just laughed. He didn't even remember the story. He was yeah, like, well, that, yeah. he's like, that is definitely something that would have riled me up too. He's like, so I appreciate that. And, you know, and now he knows that we, you know, we own about $200 million worth of real estate. And he's just like, wow, what a, what an amazing journey you've been on. Oh, for sure. So, so that's what happened. So Travis and I met, um, he actually trained my, my dog and that's how Travis and I met. Oh, that's wild. So, and Travis is your business partner now. Travis is my business partner. He yeah. started the business with me in 2011 and, um, 
you know, my wife was attacked by a dog when she was a kid. Oh my goodness. And we got, we adopted a little pit bull, um, black lab puppy and it started chewing on her and she went back to the PTSD and was like, I don't, I don't want a dog. And somebody just said, Hey, before you get rid of the dog, maybe have this guy train you and, and the dog. And, um, that dog turned out to be my wife's best friend, my best friend. And through that process, uh, 10 week puppy class, my business partner and I, he was the one that was running the training class. And That's wild. we started chatting and he was in underground development. He was doing like laying sewer lines and stuff with his, uh, oh, okay. with his family doing underground development. And he, and I was doing, um, you know, the bank owned stuff and we sat down, wrote a business plan and said, Hey, I think we can wholesale some of these deals. I think if you take them down ourselves and flip them to somebody else and let them go do the work and make a rip. And, and that's where we started in 2011. We started wholesaling properties. Um, the first four or five years, we got our teeth kicked in and just not understanding what business we were building. Didn't have any mentors around us. Weren't mm -hmm. listening to podcasts. Um, so really a struggle from going to, you know, both W2 jobs to trying to figure out how do I start a business and grow a business and be successful at it. And it was a lot of trial and error. Um, and I remember when we were flipping one house, my business partner called me one day. He said, Hey, this is the third time I'm at home Depot today. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's brutal. And he was like, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And um, we started finding some podcasts of some other guys that were doing big volume. And okay. And we started calling them up and saying, hey, how do you do that? And I mean, we didn't even know that there was like a mastermind world out there yeah. yet. Wasn't as big back then, was it? I don't think so. I mean, I now there's so. now there's a lot of guys selling courses and yeah. you know, doing masterminds. And and I rave about them. I mean, I, the group that we found um, took us from doing 16 deals in 2016 to over 150 years, uh, deals a year in, uh, wow. in three years. So it grew very rapidly. Um, almost, almost a little bit too rapidly. I think in hindsight, we yeah. were really exploding our growth. We were pump, putting like 50, $60,000 a month in marketing on the street and like, gee, just, burn, yeah. just burning quite deals. A, quite a machine. <laughs> Thank, thanks for being vulnerable and, and, you know, sharing the struggle, you know, for the first four to five years, because it, it is. I mean, I, that was my experience. That's most people's experience. Getting into business for yourself is, is a struggle because you have to build it. You know, yeah. whatever company you're leaving, to some degree or another, they already have the machine built. They have the company built. You're just a piece of it and they can share some of the profit with you. And there's, you know, there's some ease in that. Um, you know, whereas when you go and you've got to create all the income yourself. And, and we just celebrated our 10th year uh, a couple months back. And only 4% of businesses make it to 10 years. It's 10, yeah. And wow. that was like, we, we sat down and we, we kind of told the team like how, what that made us feel like and, and how hard it was and, and all those things. My wife and I, in the first couple of years, would be brand ambassadors, right? Like, the, um, like we would go to show Jeeps or Saturns on the weekends at malls and stuff and be like the brand ambassador getting paid 15, 16, 17 bucks an hour to do those things randomly on the weekends so that we could keep the lights on sometimes wow. when, you know, I mean, it, it's not yep. all rainbows and butterflies, right? It's the, the first couple of years is a struggle because you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, again, if you have it to do it all over again, finding a mentor, finding other business Which, owners yeah. be around really helps you cut the line there. But we didn't know what we didn't know. So we, yeah. you know, we were just building it and trying to figure it out. And thank God we, my business partner and I both have uh, really supportive wives. So yep. through those ups and downs and Hey babe, we can't, you know, pay the mortgage payment this, right, this week. Like we have to go to your parents maybe and see if they'll feed us this week. Like some of those struggles are real, right? It's not like we were just we didn't just fall on top of the mountain. And, oh my uh, goodness. I know. And it, it's like, people look at you now where you're at Steven and they would say, Hey, how do I get, get to be where you're at? And I, I know some people, you know, I'm, 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 you know, at least six, eight, 10 steps behind you, but even some people reach out to me and sometimes I'm like, man, I, you know, I want to be, I want to be honest with you. Cause like where I'm, what I'm doing today and where we're at today is not where we were, you know, even a few years ago and it's, yeah. it's really tough. So just, you know, you, you want to prepare people because not everybody would be, you know, willing to go through that or certainly excited to go through yeah. 
Yeah. One of my favorite quotes is like, what's it going to cost you? Everything. But yeah. it will be worth it. Sure. Yep. You know? Yep. Well, and Steven, since, since coaching was so impactful for you, can you share maybe maybe one thing that, what did they what did they say to you? What did you kind of implement? I mean, I don't want to get so much in the flipping business. I'd love to talk more about multifamily, but just, you know, yeah. to kind of get you over that hump of struggling for four to five years to cranking it up, you know, I mean, your business went exponential with, with um, coaching, what, what was maybe one or two of the things that they implemented or helped you implement? So I think, you know, a lot of these um, coaching programs will help you with systems and processes, which okay. is super important, right? And, and to build those things out. But I think it's the four minute mile mentality too, right? When you see somebody else in the room doing 150 deals a year, you yeah. recognize that that's simply a knowledge gap between yep. you and them that you can figure out how to fill, right? And they're going to give you a yes. lot of the tools to do that, which... So it was these kind of self-limiting beliefs, I think, right? I, you know, there's absolutely no doubt that the most successful people that I'm around become philosophers after a certain level, right? And it's easy to philosophize after the fact when you're looking back and going, oh, I wasn't ready for that level of success or I wasn't ready for that next jump and that's why it didn't come, right? I needed to grow as a person. I needed to grow as a human being to expand my capacity for attaining that level. And... I, you know, I have friends that are selling businesses for 50, 80, hundred million dollars. And when you get around these guys and you sit down and you try to really figure out like, what's the biggest thing, right? It's, um, it's always been mindset. It's always been the recognition that growth as a core value is a requirement to be ultra successful. I think a lot of people that are, um, moderately successful probably have some level of growth as a core value, but like, the, the guys that I know that are ripping the wheels off are some of the most growth oriented, humble guys because they've gotten their key, teeth kicked in. They, they know that they're not the smartest guy in the room. They might be the richest guy in the room, but they know they're not the smartest guy in the room. Sure. Willing not about everything and, at least. They're going to go learn and they're yep. going to go, you know, and so I think that's really what that group gave me was one recognition that like, Hey, if they can do it, I could do it too. And then two, you have to grow as a person to grow your capacity to the level of, yep success that you want to attain. You don't just yeah. get to have it now based on where your mindset is. Well said. Yeah. And just hard work alone isn't going to get you there. Right, Stephen? I mean, it sounds like you and your partner mm -hmm. and your wives we were hard. absolutely <laughs> willing to put in the hard work, but yeah. it only gets you so far. I mean, it got you pretty, you know, 16 years a year sounds like a ton to me, um, but it's, it's not 150, you know? So yeah, right. re really well said, man. Um, wait, that considering all that, you know, so you, you finally get there, man, you, you're crushing it. It sounds like you were ripping the wheels off with your business doing 150. And then you made this big pivot, this big transition and, and said enough of that. I'm, I want to go into multifamily. I, I want to go into apartments. I want to go into self-storage. Some people, I mean, especially people trying to build a flipping business right now, and maybe they're at 16 and, and want to be at 150 to think that you must be crazy or, or like what happened. So uh, take us through that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, just again, getting around mentors, right? And some of the guys that have made the transition from single to multi with, that are around us, um, you know, we, we started recognizing, wow, we're giving away 50 plus percent of our income to the federal government and state governments that were, paying, we're getting killed in taxes. I mean, when you, when you have a multiple seven figure year business and you're writing seven figure tax checks, that's painful. Um, you know, so we started to research, like how do I pay less in taxes legally? And then we just, you know, somebody referred me to uh, the book Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wilright. Okay. And he's Kiyosaki's yep. CPA. Yep. yep. And um, Tax-Free Wealth really opened my eyes to a different world. I used to think, especially if you're a flipper or wholesaler, that the IRS is the boogeyman going to jump out and get you. And yep. if you're doing things incorrectly, that's possible. Um, but what Tax-Free Wealth taught me was that, you know, the tax code is a book of rules to get incentives if you play by the rules. Right. And multifamily and commercial real estate in general is just a tax advantaged asset class because it creates a lot of jobs, it creates a lot of housing and the government incentivizes you for that, right? Regardless yep. of what political party you're on, since the fifties, commercial real estate has been tax advantaged. And for good reason, right? People need good places to live. Yep. Um, so then we started looking into it and finding out that like, hey, you can do cost segregation studies, you could get depreciation, you can offset some of your income. And once we started to figure that out, we were like, oh, I think we built the wrong business. Yeah. And that's, that's a, a, 
you know, it's um, one of the analogies I always hear is like, you know, make sure that you're running up the right mountain when you go to climb the mountain, right? Or climbing a ladder. You climb the ladder and you realize it's leaning up against the wrong building or something. Yeah, one of those yeah, analogies. Yeah, right. So, yep. And so we just got around other people smarter than us and said, hey, you know, if we wanted to build something or buy something, what should we get? Like maybe we're, maybe we're going to get some quads or some duplexes. Um, and they said, no, it's difficult to manage. You're just going to build yourself another job. So I was like, okay, so maybe we take the big leap and do like a 30 unit. And yeah. these guys kept telling me like, nah, too small. They're like you really need to get up there. And um, I was like, well, how, how am I going to go buy, you know, a hundred unit building? Like, how's that going to happen? And again, just kind of starting the, the research process, getting right. around people that were already doing it and trying to figure it out. And, um, so our first deal, we partnered with another operator who just needed some capital and we brought all the capital and we partnered on the deal 50, 50. And our first deal was a 1183 unit ground up self-storage development in Orlando. Okay. 180,000 rentable square feet, 14 acre development project. It was a $12 million deal that it's probably worth about 20 million now. Um, so just really solid deal. And we did three of those. We had, we built about 400,000 square feet of self-storage managed by cube smart in and around the Orlando area. Um, and we didn't pay taxes that year. And <laughs> what a difference. So and I recognize like, wow. You're flipping business, Steven? Kind of. Yeah. We okay. were like 50, 50. Scaling in, it down, right? but, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then still that, making money, but now you're not paying so much in taxes. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, so at that time we were bringing my chief operating officer on and I was like, I was hiring him for the wholesale business. And then we're closing these other deals and I'm seeing the benefits of this business. And I just, oh, we took him out for a beer and we said, Hey, we still want you to come on, but we want you to run a different business. And I was like, I think we're going to fire everybody. You're going to come on. You're going to help us scale this other business because the, the thought process is, you know, and people said like, well, why, why'd you wind that business down? You had a chief operating officer come in. You could have continued to operate that business and, you know, made a bunch of money with it. Two reasons. One, it was too transactional, right? It just, I was getting burnt from it. It was like, there's constant turnover. There's constant churn. There's constant uh, churn with acquisition people. Mm -hmm. And then, and I said, all right, so it's going to take me eight to 12 months to solidify that business with my COO at the helm to where I don't have to get leaned on at all. Mm. In those next eight to 12 months that it would have taken, like by making this decision, we went out and bought 600 multifamily units. Right. Right. So it was yeah. just, I, I'm, I'm a big believer now as I get older that split focus kills businesses. And oh I see it all the time, right? Where people are trying to do a little bit of short-term rental, a little bit of multifamily, a little bit of house flipping. It's like, you know, one of my buddies says this all the time and he's a super wealthy guy. So like the riches are in the niches. You can't be all things yeah. to all people. When you start to try to do a little bit of everything, you're successful at none of them. Maybe moderately successful, right? Maybe you're paying yeah, the bills. But, yeah. So we've just become like very like, we're going to do one thing. What's the one thing we're going to go do really, really well. And that's where the fund came from. So now we, we've started a hundred million dollar equity fund. And that's all we do is we talk to investors, we raise capital, we, we vet sponsors, we partner with institutional operators that have 20 years experience or at least a billion under management. Like we fund really strong operators and our yep investors invest with us because we're doing the vetting of the deal, the operator, we're managing those managers. We have asset managers in place. And um, so that's, that's what the business has become was instead of raising money deal by deal. Now we raise money into a fund so that when the right deal comes along, we can pull the trigger. When you were looking into multifamily into self-storage and into commercial real estate, um, it, you were trying to solve a tax problem. You know, sounds like that, that was the, you know, what, um, the genesis of it. And it is for a lot of people, a lot of, you know, maybe not even business owners, but high income earners, you know, people yeah. start doing really well in their thirties and in their forties and even fifties. Go ahead. So I was just going to, you know, a little caveat to that is yes, it was a twofold problem, but really what we were trying to solve for was passivity. Got I got into real estate, right? The book over your right shoulder is rich dad, poor dad. We all read the book. We all saw the dream. We understood that there was a way to get to the investor column. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, building that wholesale business was definitely a stepping stone to it, but it w couldn't be the end all because yeah. I so actively involved in every yes. little detail. Um, You're still so that was the cash flow quadrant. 
Yeah, that was what it was. It was like, we're building this business, right? I have an eight-year-old, a four-year-old and a two-year-old. It's like, but I'm constantly running. So I built myself a job, not a business. And I feel like the fund management side can much easier become a business. And maybe it's just my own purview from going through it and seeing kind of, but that's what we were. So yeah, the Genesis was like, Hey, we're getting, we're paying too much in taxes. But then it was like, this isn't the business I really wanted or envisioned, you know, and nobody along the way told me, by the way, that, that it was going to always stay active, yeah, you know? Right. So yeah. I have plenty of mastermind running friends that are like, you know, you're, you're always dogging the single family space, but that's what got you to where you're at. And I was like, I'm not dogging it. I just recognize that that's not the business long-term that I wanted as an investor. Mm-hmm. It took active income and gave me the opportunity to make it passive. So it is a yep. huge blessing that way. Yep but it's not sustainable long-term to get yourself out of it. Like you're still very much involved in day-to-day, so. Yeah, no, no, yeah. Th- thanks for thanks for putting that caveat in there. And it, it, it's funny, um, Stephen, I think, you know, I, I came a few years after you and got into it and, and I think I was lucky to, I wasn't in masterminds, but listening to podcasts, reading some books. And sometimes I'll say, I've been on podcasts where the title was like one flip was enough because I did just one flip and came to the same realization, but it was only because I had people in my ears telling me this, that, Flipping is not investing. Flipping, it, it can be, it is real estate. Yeah. It's a great way to make money. It's a great way to get started. And I go back and I say, I'm glad I did that flip. But after just one, because, you know, I sold my wife on this passive income dream, just, just like, you know, you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad before I got in real estate, told her how great this was going to be and passive income. And we'll just sit back and collect checks. And then we do a flip. And she's like, yeah, that's nothing like what you told me it was going to be. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. Live and learn, though. <laughs> yep, yep, absolutely. And, and it can't, but it, to your point, too, Stephen, like it, it can be a great way to get started. It can be a great way to generate extra income. So, hey, let me ask you one quick question before we transition. Um, it's a difficult market to find good deals, uh, at least in, in, in my opinion. How are you guys doing it? How are, and I know it's not you, but how are the operators that you guys are partnering with? How are you guys still finding deals that, that um, offer the returns that, you, that I'm sure you expect for your investors? Yeah, so that's the key, right? Is mm-hmm. either you need to have a built out acquisition team, right? Beating the street and getting broker relationships and doing that. Um, and frankly, if you're, if you're newer right now, it's harder, right? And that's, mm-hmm. partially, that's partially why we made the transition too. It was like, hey, we get to hitch ourselves to a different wagon. So the operators we're partnering with I mean, the last deal we did was a 384 unit acquisition in Daytona Beach. It was a $42 million deal and it was off market. And yeah. the reason that we got that was because our operator partner is 40 years in the business. Like sure. that level of experience and you know that level of just being that longevity in the business gives them a great opportunity. I mean, who knows Grant Cardona seeing deals you and I aren't seeing. Right. Right. I mean, yep. so that's the thing is by hitching ourselves to the right wagons and only having a handful of solid operators that we know have those deep relationships, yep. we still have more deals than we can fund. Yeah. Yeah. Good point, man. I, I just reached out to one of my mentors the other day and, and was kind of asking the same question, like, how are you making these deals pencil these days? Because they've, they've closed on some great properties. And I'm like, how are you competing? And he's like, well, Lee, like we're not. You know, if we yeah. would have had to compete on these deals, we wouldn't have gotten them. But we yeah. were the only ones in on them. And he's like, it just goes to it, you know, for him, he's over a decade uh, in the business. So yeah, that's a key, good point there. Um, I, I know you're, you're um, you know, a Christ follower, family is very important to you. Um, what has real estate, um, you know, done, done for you and your family? How has, over this journey, how has your family been, been involved? Um, what's kind of been some of your vision behind, you know, building and then transitioning, changing your real estate business? How has your family affected that? Kind of speak into that a little bit, if you would. I would say that for the first couple of years, I told myself the entrepreneur's lie, as I've come to call it, which is I do this for my family and sure. only for my family. Um, but it's not necessarily the truth. I get fulfillment right out of my business. I love yeah. being a creator of things. The entrepreneurial lie, however, is that I do it all for my family as they suffer. <laughs> and I think that it's something that's not talked about enough. I think it's something that needs to get brought to the forefront, right? Yep. And I have some some really successful guys who um, have gone through divorces and gone through losing their kids through their businesses and things like that, all in the name of doing it for their family. And, you know, I think God has helped me a lot with this because, you know, yep. it's 
it's, it's why are you doing what you're doing, right? And for us, the purpose behind the business is to give away a lot of money. And like through donor advised funds and to give more abundantly and to teach my kids that it's better to give than to receive. And we all like nice stuff, but like that's not the purpose of our business, right? The purpose of the business is to support the family. The purpose of the family is to support Christ. And one thing trickles into the next. Sure. And I did a bad job at this in the beginning. Um, like there's no doubt that what I've learned over the last four or five years is so much more important than what I learned in the business sense, which was, you know, your business is there to support your family, not vice versa. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what real estate can do for you and your family versus what you allow it to do are sometimes different things. Mm -hmm. And there were just those grind moments, right? We talked about them in the beginning where it's like, you know, sometimes you're just working a lot to try to get this thing pushed. And my wife was super supportive. She knew that I would be miserable working for somebody else again. So she supported me and, and said, no, keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, but then you get wrapped up into it, right? Yeah. You start to ignore, like you, you don't, you take your phone to the dinner table, right? And your kids are talking at you and you're not there. You're not present. Um, I just came back from a marriage conference this weekend and you know, now my wife and I, like we, we just are so much more intentional to make sure that we recognize that the business is there to support us and we're there to support the kids um, through it. Yeah. But it takes time to start to recognize those things. So now, you know, like I, we get to have this great conversation today because I gave everybody off today. It's President's Day. Um, you know, we, I take off Fridays now where cool. I just spend time. We homeschool. I work from home. Cool. Um you know, so we're really entrenched into how to allow the business to give us what we desire, which is more time with the family. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs say that, but at the expense of their family, right? They're yep. just, hey, I'm doing this all for you kids, but they're not present for their kids. Yeah. Hey, I'm doing this all for you, babe, but they can't find time to do a date night. Mm -hmm. And and I think that is kind of like the the, the thing that we have to get real introspective about is like, am I doing this for me? Am I doing this for God? Am I doing this for my family? In what order does that exist? Mm -hmm. And, yep. um, but now that we're kind of learning through those things and, and again, again, just growth, right? Like growth through your marriage. My wife and I sure. celebrate 15 years this year, um, yeah. three kids and, and yep. a business later, you know, it's like, there was some times, right. Where it was rough, just not between her and I, but just between like, the whole chaos of family and the whole chaos of business. And oh, yeah. it's like, sometimes you just hit your head, hits the pillow at night. You're like, you're shot. Yeah. Um, but what it does allow you to do if, if you let it, and if you're intentional about it is to give you that freedom, to give you that time with your family, to give you the ability to go out on date nights and get a babysitter whenever you please. Like those are, um, those are the benefits. If you make it through those moments, right. It's just yeah. make sure that you, Oh, I know are on the same page as you're going through them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I love that. Uh, the entrepreneurs lie. Um, Steven, I've never put it exactly like that, but I, I've always kind of said something similar and, 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 uh, you know, other, um, you know, friends of mine have kind of spoken that wisdom into me, you know, you, you'll see people just grinding. And even if it's not as an entrepreneur, certainly being an entrepreneur and getting something started is a grind, but some, a lot of people do it in their, their job as well. Um, and, and that's something, you know, we're trying to reach out to those people and get them invested even passively to, to, so that they yeah. don't have to grind quite so much because it is easy to say, I'm doing this for my family. But to your point, it's like, okay, but you're like losing your family over this, you know, like you don't have a relationship. And you know what I see too a lot, Lee, is like when we, when we talk about that stuff, we almost do it with a badge of honor. Yeah. Right. The rise yeah. and grind. Like, and I, I called myself out on this, by the way, I, I posted a meme 10 years ago on Facebook and it comes up on like your memories. Right. And it was, yeah. and it was one of those, um, you know, one of the guys he's holding a drink, he's laughing from, uh, from mad, yep. mad men. I know that right? one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it says like, Oh, you work 40 hours a week and he's laughing hysterically. He goes, I remember my first part-time job. <laughs> And I shared that a couple of years back and I was like, yo, this is broken thinking. Like, I didn't know that at the time, but I thought that that's what was needed to be a success in the entrepreneurial game. So I did, I did that. And I was like, you know, rising grind, let's go, you know, you got to hit the, the difference between a lion and gazelle is like, whoever gets eaten is going to be up earlier. Like all these things that were quippy, but were actually stealing my joy in the process. 
and making me rely on that as a badge of honor versus one, God being the head of the business and allowing me to be mm -hmm. a success. Mm -hmm. And then two, just learning more and growing and being able to say, hey, I'm not successful yet because I still have a lot to learn versus I'm going to outgrind you. And hard work is important, right? There's sure. no doubt that you have to work hard. But the badge of honor that comes with this, like, this mentality, you know. I think is really toxic to, to entrepreneurs. I think it's toxic and they don't recognize it. And I didn't recognize it in myself until I started growing through it and going, wow, I can see how detrimental that can be to my own psyche if I allow it to continue to infiltrate me. Right. Yep. And it's like, because what it's basically saying is like, nothing else is important. I'm just going to go focus on this thing and outwork everybody. But it's like, there's, that's one piece of life. Right? I know. One thing that I've found over the last couple of years is like money only solves money problems. And, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Well and like you have other things in your life that need to be focused on intentionally, not just the business. So, you yep. know, it's like, how are you balancing those things in, in the right way? Right. And I think something that's so true of her is like, every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else, whether you, whether you know it or not. You know, I, I think, you know, the entrepreneurs, I, you can trick yourself into thinking that that's providing and, and stuff. And, and again, right. to some degree it is, but man, you just have to, you have to step back. I, I think, you know, another thing you said there, Stephen, that's so important is just being intentional. I think stepping back, you know, they, there's so many books and, and so many wise um, men and women that have, you know, been successful business. They talk about working on the business, not in the business. I think that's really important, but it's also to, you know, you step back and, and look at your relationship with your wife, look at your relationship with your kids too. step back. And how, how is that? How is that going? And then, you know, for guys like us, Stephen, it's so important to, to be in prayer about that. And like, you know, is this where God wants you? At the conference this week, it was cool. I mean, and just such a simple truth to recognize, but hard to implement is, you know, the enemy loves division and isolation, right? Yeah. Unity is the love language of the Holy Spirit. And That's like, awesome. man, yeah. does our business allow for both of those things if we allow it, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, you really just, uh, again, intentionality is everything. Are you allowing your business to create division and isolation within your own life? Or is it something that's creating unity in your own life and serving what you actually want to, to sow into? Yeah, that's great, man. I love that. Good, good wisdom there. Wait, um, I always like to ask two questions at the end, and, and this is kind of a perfect segue. So, you know, if you're talking to someone that wants to get into real estate investing, maybe, or maybe maybe they're, you know, already kind of getting going, but they want to make that transition, what would you say is, is one common characteristic or a key ingredient to have success in real estate investing? Well, I think it's not just real estate investing. I think it's any business that you're going to start mm -hmm. is, is really knowing your why. And this is, okay. yeah. this is like probably a common theme in, in this answer maybe, but um, your why is what's going to push you through those tough days. Your why is what's going to make you celebrate the wins and they're going to taste sweeter. Your why is what's going to say like, man, I'm, I'm going to persist no matter what. And I don't think enough business owners start a business without core values yeah, or knowing their why. And I think if you do those two things, then you have a much better chance of success out of the gate without floundering for a couple of years because, man, you're really dialed in as to why you're doing what you do. And I think a lot of us um, need to continually hone that skill of knowing why we're doing what we're doing yep. in all facets of our life, but especially entrepreneurs because – there are going to be days where you don't want to do it. Yeah. You don't want to do the boring work. You don't want to do the hard work. You don't want to do even the fun work sometimes. Like sometimes you're just not going to want to do it, but your why will drive you through. You know, getting real specific about that, it makes me think of your story, Stephen, where like it also probably helps with making sure you're building the right business. Sure. You know, if you keep coming back to that, like, okay, what are we going after? All right, is this business getting us to that? Because at some point you said, no, it's not like it's a, it's a, I built a great business, but it's actually not going to do what we want it to do for us. So right. yeah, great advice there. So let me, a little bit of spin on that. Um, what uh, would you say is like a key ingredient to while you're building a real estate business or being an entrepreneur or just, you know, being a real estate investor, what's a key ingredient to make sure you keep your priorities in, in order that you pursue your wife, that you pursue your kids. What's something maybe you're doing, maybe you're doing, maybe you and your wife are doing. I mean, you've kind of given us a few things, but what's maybe a key ingredient to make sure you're keeping your priorities straight? Yeah, so um, two things that we do, and it's stolen from people smarter than me. Um, 
which most things are, right? There's yep. nothing new under yep. the sun. Uh, so a buddy of mine, his name is Jim Shields. He wrote a great book called 18 Summers mm. and another great book called Family Board Meeting. And so with the kids, I'll talk about intentionality real quick as it's ripped from his book. Go listen to the 18 Summers podcast with Jim or go read his book, 18 Summers. It's phenomenal. But he's a real estate guy who saw himself getting off the path with his kids and like really wanted to be intentional about how to make sure that those relationships stayed um, really strong. And so every quarter, my wife and I each go out on a date with each one of our kids. So I'll go out with my oldest, she'll go out with her oldest. So it, it turns out it's like we have three kids. So it's every other Saturday is a board meeting and a board meeting with your kids, simply um, no phones, an activity that they choose, regardless of age, for four hours. So like wow. last a couple of weeks ago, my wife and my oldest, who's eight, went to uh, one of those little painting party things and they both yep. painted llamas together. And, uh, and then they went out to dinner and they just talked, but no phones allowed. Daddy and mommy can't be on the phone. Um, Love that. We're talking about things that they want to talk about. And what's cool about letting them pick the activity, right? Is like you get to see where their interests change and when, mm -hmm. and then, and it just, it gives you that time to have fun, which builds the relationship so that they can come and open up to you. Because I think as parents, we do um, our kids a disservice and I'm sure we can all look at our own parents and say, Oh, this is where we could have done better. But yeah. Where like, especially as entrepreneurs, right? We're walking around the house on our phone and they're like, hey, dad, hey, dad, hey, dad. And you're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Or you try to sit down at dinner and be intentional for 10 minutes and try to fill in the gaps. But like, it's just not enough time, right? I do this with my team on a quarterly basis. Why wouldn't I do this with my kids? On I know, yep, yep. So, yeah. so that's one thing that we do with the kids. Um, and, then, and then similarly, what my wife and I um, do is we'll, we'll map out our yearly goals together. Um, similarly to what we do with the business. It's like, okay, so mm -hmm. what's the goal this year? What, when do we want to do those things? And then every Friday night after we put the kids to bed, we'll sit down and we'll, um, we'll look back on the week, reflect, and then say, okay, so this coming week, let's pick the three like big things that we want to do this week. One for our marriage, two for the kids, and three for like the household, right? And we'll just choose those three clear goals that we want to accomplish that week. And those are the three goals that we want to make sure that we get yeah. done together. Getting clarity, man. Yeah. Good That's focus. it, right? There's an inverse relationship between stress and clarity. When there's stress in the relationship, it's because of lack of clarity and vice versa. Perfect. So if we can just make, make it clear as to what we're doing this week and why we're doing those things, super easy, takes five minutes and we're both in agreement and then we're both rowing in the same direction. To yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Love the intentionality there. And um, Steve, before I let you go, uh, what can my uh, listeners and I be praying for? for you in the coming weeks. And so pray for our donor advised fund. So our BHAG is a big, hairy, audacious goal for those who haven't read that book. Yeah. Um, our, our BHAG and our business, which do doesn't have a timeline on it, it's just what all of us have agreed is our uh, big, hairy, audacious goal is to give 80% of the income that comes in through the business through the donor advised fund. And we started with this through some prayer and we said, hey, Lord, how do I start giving now more abundantly before I make it there? Yeah, And, you know, Lord clearly was like, well, just partner with me on every deal. So the first deal we did a 1% gift of income and revenues to our donor advice fund. Second was 2%, 4%, 10%. We're up to 20% on, um, on that $42 million project. Wow, so it's, yeah. it's been amazing to see what God has done, but, you know, so pray for our donor advice fund that God continues to fund that thing abundantly. And, uh, and then also that we can influence other operators to start the same thing. Because I think in this community specifically, we have a lot of go-givers and abundant-minded people that yep. can easily get distracted by the Ferraris and the, the fun stuff. Um, but, you know, we, we put our giving goal out there first and then back our number of deals that we want to do in from that, not an income goal, right? Well, and I think it just puts your heart in a prone position before the Lord to say, hey, Lord, this is what our goal is, right? And what's cool is to see him blow past that stuff. Yeah, I know. Yep. Because um, he does. He shows yeah, he up, does. he shows off. And, yep. Um, so yeah, that's that's our goal. Our goal is to uh, fund many ministries around the world through this business. And that's awesome. yeah, just keep us in prayer for that. Yeah, love to do that. Absolutely, man. We'll be praying for you guys with that. Good stuff, Stephen. Hey, thanks so much, man. This has been awesome uh, for me. I know for my listeners, we really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Lee. Appreciate you, man. Great. Take care, man. See ya. Thank you for joining us for another great episode. 
I hope you'll take action on what you've learned today. If you enjoyed today's show, please consider leaving Lee a five-star rating and review. And check him out on threefoldrei.com. Until next time, 1 Timothy 6.17.